I'll tell you what, I want you to turn your Bibles to uh, Galatian chapter five, verse 16. That's going to be a foundational verse. But what we're going to talk about today is the thing that glues and keeps our walk in living in the spirit intact. And that is the trust factor, the trust factor. That's what we're going to deal with today, the trust factor, because it's vitally important that you really trust the Lord. And a lot of times I don't think we do. Hallelujah. By the actions of a lot of people, I'm, con uh, I'm convinced that there are a lot of people in the body of Christ that really don't trust the Lord. Now, they say they do, but uh, experiences show you that they really don't. Hallelujah. And so now uh, I told you go to Galatians chapter five, verse 16. That's our foundational verse. It says walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, we've always put it on the board with you in an amplified fashion, and I'm not going to go that way today because I believe you've heard that enough. Hopefully you have a revelation of it. If not, we'll have to go back through it again. But I want you to turn your Bibles real quickly, real quickly to Acts chapter two, Acts chapter two. Hallelujah. The day of Pentecost has happened. The people are filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. The 120 in the, in the upper room are totally filled and all speaking in another language that was untaught by man to them. And a crowd of people are gathering around and they're hearing this and they're, they're, they're uh, 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 m amazed and perplexed about what's going on. Now, the Bible tells us uh, the Bible tells us that in Acts chapter two, verse 12, it says they were all amazed and perplexed, which means they were filled with uncertainty at what they were hearing when the uh, when uh, the uh, when the experience happened uh, on the day of Pentecost. But then in verse 14, in fact, in fact if you go back to verse 12, I'm not going to read the verse, but if you go back to verse 12, it says that so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this be? Then it also says in verse 13, others mocked them, saying they were are full of new wine. The Bible says in verse 14, though, I want you to hear this. Peter stands up and starts to preach the word of God to him. And he says, men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem. So that lets me know that the men of Judah and all who dwelt in Jerusalem was in that place that day. They were all there. Or Peter would not have said, <laughs> and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, but they were all there in that place that day. Then in verse 14, not in verse 14, excuse me, uh, Peter goes on to preach his message. And then in verse seven, uh, 37, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the, the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, God was giving me this on the way to church today. What shall we do? So the Bible tells us here that, 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 now they were, excuse me, now they, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And I asked the Lord, who was cut? Okay, who was cut to the heart? It could not have been them all. Well, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, because if we go on uh, uh, in verse, uh, let me see where I want to go. Verse 41, it says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized that day. About 3000 souls were added to them. So now I want to I'm, I'm, I'm going to draw this together like this. And then I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. Everybody, everybody in J Jerusalem heard the word. It, it was such a phenomenon that people from all over came around. So they had a massive crowd hearing these 120 uh, receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit and their prayer language. Peter then stands up in the midst of him and he proclaims to the men of Ju Judah and all who dwelt in Jerusalem because all was there, the word of God. And he goes on to preach 
a message, a very powerful message in that day, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed and led by God to do it. Now the Bible says, now when they heard this, they were cutting their heart. And I asked God the question, how many was cutting their heart? Because the Bible says, goes on to say in Acts chapter two, verse 41, it says again, then those who gladly received his word. So that lets me know there were those that did not gladly receive the word that was not cut in their hearts. I asked the Lord a question because I wanted to know why is it that the people of God, the people of God, because there's a different, look, how I want to say this. The devil is not scared of you if you're born again and you're living in the flesh. He has, he, he has no, no shudders. He doesn't stutter or nothing when he thinks of you because there's no power. There's that fleshly living, although you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The devil is afraid of those who are baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the spirit of God. That's who he's afraid of. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. And so I said, Lord, why is it that there is so much potential, just like it was in those multitudes that heard Peter, there is so much potential in that crowd, yet that potential, just like today, is never realized. Why, Lord, why is it that your people that have potential don't stick around long enough to have God have you tap into that potential and pull out of them what's needed to go to another level? Hallelujah. He said, number one is because they, they refuse to walk in my presence. They refuse to live and walk in the spirit. Now listen to this. He said, because if they walk in with and are with me, then they'll grow to trust me when I tell them what to do. They'll grow to trust me, thank you Jesus, when I tell them what to do, how to do it, and how to tap into what God wants for them. See, Christianity, is not a natural organization. It's not a formula. Christianity is born of the spirit. And it brings people into the spirit. And it helps people to, and teaches people how to walk in the spirit and they won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Hallelujah. Christianity operates on spiritual principles. Hmm. Spiritual principles that transcend the laws of the natural universe. Got it? They transcend the laws of the natural universe. That is one reason why we get in trouble when we try to think things out. Because the things of the spirit are beyond natural knowledge or logic. So somewhere along the line, I have to tap off what I'm thinking and my reasoning and logic and tap into the spirit of God. And I can do it more easily, praise God, when I'm walking in the spirit. Hmm. Hallelujah. See, Paul was one who walked in the spirit. Now think about it. <laughs> ah, he's on the road to Damascus. He can ready to go whoop beat down, stomp down, and jail Christians. And he really believes he's doing the right thing. Very learned, very smart man, but he really was convinced that what he was doing was right until he met God or Jesus on the road to Damascus. It changed his whole life. And from that moment on, he endeavored to walk in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. He worked at this thing. Well, how do you know? Well, the man got locked up. Oh, <laughs> the jailer didn't come with keys and let him out. While he was locked up, the spirit of the Lord 
summon an angel to the door and then he unlocked the door and let him out. Now think about that. Whenever Paul went into a city, <laughs> or in a town, the demons screamed and ran out. They screamed and came out whatever they, whoever they were possessing. Now think about it. The man was walking in the spirit. Like I said before, what scares the devil is a person who walks with a revelation of his or her rights and privileges in Christ. The person that the devil is not afraid of is the one who's born again, but is, li but is living in the spirit. He has, he, has no, he has no fear concerning a person like that, for lack of a better word. The uh, devil is afraid of those who are born again, baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, have the weapon of their uh, prayer language at their disposal, walking and living in the spirit. <laughs> He's afraid of those who know, listen to this, who know spiritual principles, who knows how to use spiritual weapons and will fight the devil on his own territory. That's who the devil is afraid of. He's not afraid of a born again spirit, the born again Christian who is not walking in the spirit. Hallelujah. So now, when it comes to the body of Christ, he has devices that he uses to get us out of walking in the spirit. One of those, and I've been saying it for the last two weeks, one of them is that he attacks your emotional state. He brings into your life discouragement, distrust, <laughs> disagreement, and a host of other things to get you out of the, how I the habitual presence of God in your life. Isn't that amazing? Because it's worked with a lot of us. We're making decisions emotionally. Now think about this. Ah. <laughs> I can be so convinced I'm right that when truth comes, I'll reject it. Now think about it, meditate on it. I can be so convinced that I'm right. When truth is revealed, it doesn't change me. See, that's when I have to realize that I'm being attacked emotionally. And the only way I'm going to overcome an emotional attack of past disappointments, past hurts, uh, past achievements or whatever it is, I'm going to have to get back to walking in the spirit and relying and what? Trusting God. Amen. It is hard to trust God when you're going through. Let me uh, give you another example. When, 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 when Peter saw Jesus on the water, Peter said, Peter said, if, if it's you bid me, bid that I come to you on the water, and Jesus said, come, Peter didn't just jump out the boat. Uh-uh, he didn't just jump out the boat. Peter, <laughs> you know, trembling, kind of eased himself out the boat, you know, and tested the water. And when it held him up, then he went out. <laughs> but now, the key is, he trusted God. Amen. He trusted God. Most of us have a problem getting out the boat because we're overwhelmed with what we see. And our mind is telling us something different. Our reasoning and logic is telling us something different. And all the, all the while God is saying, come unto me all who, you who are laden and heavy laden and I, 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 I'll give you rest. There is rest when I walk in the spirit of the Lord. But now, it all boils down to how or do I really trust him? See, Paul was awesome. Ephesians chapter six. 
Go there real quickly. Ephesians chapter six, because see, Paul learned how to do it. He got a revelation on how to, on how to do it. And then he started teaching the body of Christ. Then he started teaching the body of Christ. I'm trying to get there quickly. Hallelujah. Then he started teaching the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. Now listen to this. Paul said, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He said, okay, I'm walking in the spirit. I realize now that my, my adversary is not you. <sighs> and see, we hear that a lot, but we don't have a revelation of it. My adversary is not you. It's not Sister Cornbread, it's, my, it's not Mama Chitlin, it's not uh, brother, brother Hot Sauce. My problem is not you. My problem is what's driving that. And one of the keys to, see, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, one of the keys to intimacy with God is learning how to discern correctly. Hmm, all right, we're getting into it now, praise the Lord. And so now it says, listen to this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of, wick of wickedness in heavenly places. Then he not only defines what we're really dealing with, what he goes on to do is try to tell you how to fight against it. And us and we have this attitude not really an attitude, but we've been conditioned to function in concert with our senses. So when we see something and we're convinced of it, then we have a real problem trusting God. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Give you another example. Jesus is in the bow of the ship or the stern of the ship sleep. Sleep, excuse me, there are 13 people on this ship. 12 disciples and the word. The word is in the stern of the ship. He sleep. The 12 see a storm at sea. It is scary. They've locked into the storm with their natural senses. And in spite of everything God has, they've seen God do through his son Jesus. Oh God. They've seen the dead raised. They seen uh, uh, 5,000 plus uh, fed with two loaves, uh, uh, two fish and five loaves. They seen people raised from the dead. They've seen demons ex exercised off folk with a word. And God told them, through his son Jesus, told them that we're going to the other side. Now all of a sudden, they're at a storm at sea. They see a lot going on. A storm at sea, not a rainstorm, but a storm with, with high winds, high water or waves coming at you, beating on the ship, ship taking on water. They started thinking about the condition they were in. <laughs> now meditate on it. Because I have. They're so sold out to their, to their immediate position, their immediate circumstances, they forgot their future was asleep in the stern of the ship. But when they did come to themselves, they ran down to him panicking. Said, don't you care that we are drowning, that we're going to die? And Jesus just basically said, basically said, you know, I'm disappointed you with you. Oh, you of little faith or no faith. Hmm? And while they still looking at what's going around them, they still haven't ascertained what Jesus is saying. Then Jesus said, peace be still. And everything calmed down. Hmm. It all boils down to trust. I said it all boils down to trust. Go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, in the Amplified it says, and I, and, and I now feel led to read it, but I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit, seek him and be responsive to his guidance, and then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful flesh, which responds impulsively without regard to God and his precepts. 
See, how I want to say this. Living and walking in the spirit is the product of an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. We know that. It is a relationship that requires trust. We know that, but we don't have a revelation of that. Okay, because when the issues start, we'll walk right off from Jesus in favor of what we see, say, and hear. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. God is good. This is good. I'm loving this. Developing intimacy with the Holy Spirit is an on purpose process and not a singular event. In other words, I don't try to start trusting God <laughs> when the trouble starts. I should have been doing that and practicing it all alone. Because to trust in something or somebody that you have not, <laughs> you have not uh, observed do their thing, it's hard to do. Hallelujah, it's hard to do. Now, let's keep going, I'm just starting this. Living and walking in the spirit requires that you develop an unwavering confidence in God. Doing what he says, doing what he says, and by doing so, you create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can work. We've been missing it, y'all. We say we trust until the issues start and all that goes out the window. All that goes out the window. See, you hear people say, you know, I've heard people say they went to, uh, I'll find uh, what the pastors told me, Bishop Hillier's church, Dad Price church, Winston's church, all these high, you know, they'll start to say stuff like, I'm not, I'm going somewhere else, I'm not being taught. No, that ain't true. That's not true. You're not being taught because you don't want to be. You're not being taught because something emotionally now is blocking your receivers. That's what it is. Okay, now you're not grown to, the, you haven't grown spiritually to the point where you've gone beyond teaching. What's happened again, that something emotionally or intellectually has grabbed you. And now I need, <laughs> I'm not being taught, I need to go somewhere where I can be taught. No, whenever anybody tell you that, what they're really telling you is that they've gotten offended, hurt, disappointed in something, and now it's blocking their ability to hear. Okay, or they've gotten involved with some a relationship or something. Now it blocks their ability to hear. See, and we get that way because of the fact that we can't trust God. We can't trust God with the most elementary of things. See, if I don't, if, if, if I don't put out, this guy going to leave me. If she don't put out, I'm going to leave her. See, but I'm supposed to be a born again, spirit filled Christian walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Hmm. OK, hallelujah. See, I got to remember that I'm a spiritual being who functions best when I am in concert with spiritual principles. That's, that's supposed to be the real me. But it seems like the devil is always pulling us, trying to pull us out of that relationship and fellowship we have with God. And he's vicious about it. I've said this over and over again. I love Wild Kingdom. I love watching uh, animals in their natural habitat and how they, what they do to, to, to stay alive and how they're built, made up. And you know, I, I'm amazed at the predators because the predators a lot of times remind me of the devil. Uh, wolves are, they always run in packs. You know, the devil and his demons, the devil and his agents in the church or in the world, they always run in packs. And when, 
when a person becomes disoriented, becomes upset, discouraged, mad, angry, disagreeable, rebellious, and they, and they, they feel like uh, uh, I got to go somewhere else or do something else, or I'm quitting this area, or I'm quitting that area, then these wolves start to pick a pace and come after them. Last thing they want you to do is recover in enough time and get back to the flock or get back in line, hallelujah, where the safety net of God is. When I am walking outside, <laughs> my walk in the spirit, I become prey to a predator. That predator is the enemy, amen. Because he's seeking whom he may devour. Mm. Hallelujah. He, he will devour you, be, devour you by bringing up past habits that you were once delivered of that you now embraced again. He can, and, and he can uh, 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 corner you by challenging your relationships with family, with friends. He can, he can cut you off by dealing appropriately with your, in a negative way, with your finances, with your job, okay? With working with others in the church. There's so many different avenues that he uses, but they're all tied to your emotional state. That's why God said, okay, I got you in the family. Praise the Lord. My son died for you, rose again the third day for you. Now, accept me as your Lord and Savior. Now you're in the body of Christ. Not receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit because the only prerequisite for doing that is salvation. Now you're saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. You have a prayer language, but to deal with how you're thinking, that's something I'm giving you <laughs> the charge to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Wow. Now think about it. See, if we're going to do this thing right, we have to understand that there's a developing, developing phase in an intimacy with the Holy Spirit. That development phase starts with what we call discernment. This is after I'm saved, baptized, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Because I need to understand that the enemy, it doesn't matter. He, wait, he doesn't fight fair. He don't wait till you get mature to mess with you. Listen to this. Discernment is critical. I got to know when I'm hearing God's voice, my voice, or the devil's voice. And if I don't know, I need to go to somebody that's mature enough and just throw it out to them so they can tell me. Discernment is critical. <laughs> How I want to see that. Discernment is critical. Without being critical, is critical. Discernment is critical. Stop. Without being critical, is critical. Got it? Period. I'm going to say it again. I want you to get this. Discernment is critical. Without being critical, period. How I say it? Let me go back because I want you to get this. So I'm, I'm going to add some periods where there may not be. Discernment is critical, period. Without being critical is critical, period. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's important. With the help of the Holy Spirit, training your spirit to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the word of God, I can learn how to discern. Okay, I can learn how to discern. Now, I've told you over and over again about training your human spirit because it's critical because it helps me in my discerning process to be critical but not without being critical. Be critical without being critical because that'll mess me up. Ooh. I told you, you do it by meditation. 
meditating God's word, making, giving the word of God first place in your life, practicing the word, then instantly obeying the word of God. Okay. Now, the developing phases of an intimate relationship with God is it, the development stage is what I call discernment. Then there's discipline. That's a learned behavior. And it's a product of the degree of fellowship I have in communion with the Holy Spirit. Discipline is the product. I'm going to say it again because it's a learned behavior. It is the product of, uh, of uh, based on the degree of fellowship I have in my communion with the Holy Spirit. The more I am in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the more disciplined I become. So we are de the developing phases of an intimate relationship with God starts with discernment, then goes on to discipline, then comes discovery. What do you mean? I am strengthened and anointed by the Holy Spirit to establish God's kingdom. Now, <laughs> I discover that the devil can't make me do nothing, for lack of uh, better words. He can't make me do nothing. And if I choose to do the right thing, God has my back. I discover who I am in Christ. I discover what I possess in Christ. I discover what I can do in Christ. Hallelujah. Then, <laughs> The developing phase of intimacy uh, gives us what we need to know as we become part of what I call a dispatch. Well, what do you go out in all the world and, and teach the gospel? That that if I'm walking in the spirit, there's nothing that will keep me from sharing the gospel with somebody else. The problem with us sharing the gospel with anybody is number one, the thought that we may be rejected and God has anointed you to the degree where you will be accepted more than rejected. But you don't know that. See, it's all because of trust. The lack of it. I understand that, okay, if I start leading some folk to the Lord, then I'm responsible for them. Yeah, you're right. You want them to grow from convert to disciple. Then once they reach the disciple stage, you've taught them to go convert, help convert somebody else and have them do the same for them. See, we're, we're, we're busy. We're really too caught up in our own selfishness, our own desires, our own problems. We have no time to share the gospel with the laws. We don't have that kind of time because it takes too much time. I, you know, I got, you know, I'm, I'm working on this project. I'm doing this. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm, 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 but somebody shared the gospel with you. Well, I got it at church where the preacher's supposed to do it. No, 90% of the people, 90 something percent of people never didn't get saved in the church. A lot of them got saved outside the church by people who are willing to take the time to lead them to the Lord. I don't know the exact figure, but it's a whole lot more than what actually goes to church. Or, I mean, as far as them getting that, what they needed from the church, they got it somewhere else, a friend or somebody, somebody ministered the word of God to them. See, a commitment to spiritual things is unsettling unless you trust God. I, it's hard to commit, <laughs> submit to, to the things if it's hard to do it if I don't trust God. If I don't trust God, it's hard for me to do. You do that with natural things. There are things that you trust, things that you don't. It's okay until you overcome that. Mm -mm. Nope. Hallelujah. If I mistrust something or somebody or some process, hallelujah, and I'm presented with the facts that it is not that way, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You haven't won them over. Hallelujah. Now, 
Got some questions to ask you. I don't have much time, but I got some questions to ask you. Number one, do you have an unwavering confidence in the Lord? In first Kings or second Kings chapter 18, let's go to first Kings or second Kings chapter 18, second Kings chapter 18. Do you have an unwavering confidence? That's trust. That's what trust really means. An unwavering confidence in the Lord. Do you have that? Verse one, it says, now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Now, he was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Hmm. Got it. His mother's name was Abba, the daughter of Zechariah. Now listen to this. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images and broke to pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Now, when they say the bronze serpent that Moses had made, they're talking about the Exodus experience when, when uh, uh, God had Moses fashion a serpent, raise it on the pole, and he killed all those who were uh, plagued in the children of Israel. Well, Moses is gone. The, the, the bronze serpent has, does not have that kind of pull on it anymore, but the people started worshiping it, the serpent. They started worshiping the serpent instead of God. In fact, they even gave it a name. I think of somebody, Neshatine or something like that. They gave the serpent a name. And so what Hezekiah did is that he came and broke and beat down that, that, that image. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Natashtin. Uh, then in verse five, it says, listen to this. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Now listen to this. For he held fast to the Lord and did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded him. Last verse, listen to this. And the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Now, what the kings were doing up to that point, they're, they're, they were giving bounty like to these kings, like a ransom or just paying to keep them from, keep those kings from invading their territory because he trusted God so much. He quit paying that, that, blackmail, money, that blackmail money is what I would call it. Hallelujah. So the Bible says he trusted God fully. Wow. And because of that, God prospered him. You're struggling because you're in and out, in and out, in and out emotionally, in and out intellectually, in and out because I've been hurt, in and out because of a lie, in and out, in and out. And because of that, you can never grasp hold to the promises of God in your life. Not fully, and sometimes not at all. See, uh, Psalms chapter, let's see, I don't know if I want to go there. Yeah, uh, so, so, so can, the question is now, I ask you, do you have an unwavering confidence in the Lord? In other words, what I'm asking you is that it's really a, the same question, but I'm saying it a different way. Can you trust God? Oh yes, amen, hallelujah, I trust the Lord. No, when the pressure's on and you see and, then, and you are in the storm, like the 12 on the boat, do you trust God? Hmm? I know it's a cliche, we say, oh yes, I trust the Lord. 
But deep down, do you trust God? Psalms chapter 9 verse 10 says, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. I know his name. I have a revelation of who he is and what he can do because I'm walking with him. Can't y'all see that? I'm walking with him and when I walk with him, I know him. Oh my God. Huh. For, I'm gonna read it again. For those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Hmm. When I seek his presence, when I seek on a daily basis to live and walk in the spirit, when something happens, I know your name. Lord help, I know your name. I call it done in Jesus' name. How can I do that? Because I know your name. The name curtails more than you just knowing the name. It it curtails all that substantiates and upholds that name. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm getting a little happy here. A little praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go, go. <laughs> See, so I have to understand. Go to Psalms 138, verse 2. Real quickly. Around Psalms 138. I was going to bypass this, but I'm not now. Psalms 138, verse 2. Hallelujah. Psalms 138, verse 2. It says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and truth. For you have magnified your word above your name. Oh my God. Hmm. So if I know your name, then I know that your word you placed even before your name. So whatever you promised me in your word can be manifested in my life. Hmm. Amen. So, so, <laughs> hallelujah. When, can you trust God? So, so I'm going to give you a couple of things to help you here. His order mandates, it, mandates that you walk in the spirit and not in your feelings. John chapter four. I hope y'all getting something out of this because I am. John chapter four. Verse 23. We know the verse. Hallelujah. We know the verse. Hallelujah. John chapter 4, verse 23, it says, <laughs> it says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Lord is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and they that worship him must, it's not an option, but, but must worship him in spirit and in the word, in truth, truth, you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. So in spirit and in the word, wow. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. So now I have to understand that, that, that he orders and mandates me to walk in the spirit, not in my feelings then I can start to answer yes that I trust God. John chapter 7 verse 17 says if anyone, this Jesus talking is read that letter edition, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine or the word. If you want to do his will, you'll know that you, have, you can do it by the word. Whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. You read the word, get the word in you, you'll find out whose authority it is behind the word of God. Hmm. I got to learn how to walk. And he's mandated me to walk in the spirit, not in my feelings. The second thing that, that under, under can you trust God I'd like to get to is that you must surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit. And that's hard to do when your feelings have been hurt. It's hard to do when you feel or you see something else or you've heard something else or you're hearing or heard something else or hearing something else. It's hard to do when you're feeling something else. That's when we find out whether or not you really trust God. 
That's when you're going to find out whether or not you really trust God. And if you don't, then there's some things you can do. Praise God that he's got a system in, 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 in line where you can get that trust that you need to overcome whatever circumstance you're going in or dealing with. Hmm. Now, last question. Now, I got a couple more questions. I'm going to do this Wednesday night. This is good. Question number two, can you trust your approach to spiritual things? Can you trust the, your approach to God? Can you, trust your, can you trust your approach to spiritual things? Can you do it? Now that is a good question. Cause see, most, a lot of people think that when, okay, I need to get spiritual. Oh, no, 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 nah, 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 nah. Now, that's a, a part to play in it, but, but a small part. Mm. See, God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, that he does not want us ignorant or uninformed about spiritual things or spiritual gifts. Mm. Now, listen to this very carefully. Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 says that all the promises of God are received by faith. Hmm. Then in Isaiah 28, verse 10, he says, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Now I'm going to put all this together in a minute. You need to write the scriptures down. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 basically says that your chief motivation is love. Hmm. Hmm. Well, then. How do I trust, can you trust your approach to spiritual things? Now listen to this very carefully. Number one, I know that God doesn't want me to be ignorant about spiritual things. So that requires that I be in the word, right? Then I understand that in order for me to approach God, I have to realize, get a revelation of all the promises of God are received by what? Faith. So, to get in his presence, to walk in the spirit or live in the spirit, I have to do it by faith. Faith is that unwavering trust and confidence I have in God. Listen to this very carefully. Got it? I understand that, that, that whatever what God does, he's going to do it line upon line, precept upon precept. In other words, he's going to deal with me first. He ain't going to deal with your situation first. He's going to deal with you first because basically you may be the major problem. So he's going to deal with you first, man, and let it happen. It's fun. Now, it's, it's not fun when you're getting rebuked, but then God says, the person, the people I love, I chastise because I love them. When God starts to correct you, realize he loves you more than you'll ever know until you get there. Amen? So, so we walk by faith. Everything's done line upon line, precept upon precept. And, and you know what? While I'm walking with him, I'm developing this love relationship with him. And then love becomes my major, major motivation. That's why you hear people say, you know what? If he never does another thing for me, I'm going to serve him because I love him. Oh, yeah. If he never does another thing for me, I'm going to serve him because I love him. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. I'm going to serve him because I love him. See, God is doing a new thing in you, but he needs your permission and your cooperation in it. Because the way you've been thinking ain't been right. See, but you think you have been. See, and you've done some things that become habitual to you and you convince yourself that it was it was all right. And it's not. It's not. Quit lying to yourself. Quit deceiving yourself and go to God. Now, there was a there's a story of a land developer who employed a real estate agent to buy this plot of land. Now, the building on this land was jacked up, jacked up. It's about 20 acres, but the building on this land was pitiful. It was only good to be torn down. 
And so now, the agent kept trying to convince him, look, I got better property with better buildings on it. I got something over here, something over there. Why in the world would you still want this piece of land with this junky, raggedy, rat-infested building on it? Why would you do that? To bring it back up to cold, gonna cost you millions. Why would you do it? <laughs> what the agent didn't understand was that the developer wasn't looking at the building. He was looking at the site. Oh boy. He wasn't looking at the building. He was looking at the site. Hallelujah. God is not looking at your building as it is now. He's looking at your sight. And in his sight, in his sight, God, or in that sight, what God wants to do is that he wants to, be, wants to build a new you. And it's not too late. He wants to build a new you. It ain't about what's been going on. It ain't about the condition of your building. God wants to build a new you. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we dare not leave this broadcast today without at least... Ex uh, giving that invitation to you. God says in his word that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God is raising from the dead, we shall be saved. So now, if you're here today or you're listening or you'll be listening in the near future, this is for you. Hallelujah. I want you to repeat with this after me, those of you who are watching now I want you, and you're not saved and Jesus is not Lord of your life, I want you to repeat this after me. Say, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, because he's the one that's going to do it. In the precious name of Jesus, I receive you now as my personal Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. I receive you into my heart and I give you praise for accepting me. I give you praise, Father, for the baptism with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, whom I receive now in Jesus' name. So now I can confess to the world, and I do. I'm saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and ready to serve you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, if you made that confession, you're in the family of God. Now, you believed it in your heart, you're in the family of God right now. Now what God wants to do is that he wants to build a new you. Hallelujah. He's got a new plan. He's got new schematics or blueprints, and he wants to build a new you. And my suggestion to you is that you let him do it. Now, you can't do it unless you go somewhere and get taught how to discern the blueprints. Well, New Covenant is that place. You can come New Covenant, and here we will teach you how to read the blueprints that's going to change your life and build the new you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So if, if that's the case, then what I, we want you to do, I think it'll be on the board. If it's not on there now, it will be that, that uh, if you made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, we want you to text NCCC to 71441. Leave us your information so we, that we can contact you, name, address, and things like that, so we can contact you and we give you information that will help you to understand what you've done by giving your life to the Lord, being saved and baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so now, as secondly, if you're here today and, you know, you'd like to make New Covenant Christian Center your church home, well, we dare not leave here today without at least inviting you to make the church that loves like none other your church home. So now, what we'd like you to do is text NCCC to 71441, leave your information there, and know what, we'll get back with you and we'll give you the information needed so you'll understand the vision that God has called us to in this church, hallelujah. And so now, we want you to catch the fire, and again, God wants to build a new you. Come where you can hear uh, and get explained the blueprint and the schematics that God has designed for your life so you can reach your full potential. Number three, 
Praise the Lord. If you're here, if you're here today or you watching this broadcast and you have a prayer request, we do not want you to send us just your prayer request. We want to make sure we make contact with you. We are building disciples. We're not just getting prayers answered. Answered. we want to help build disciples. Those who can pray for themselves and pray for others and see results. That's what we want to build. In order to do that, we need your information when you leave it. So you leave your information with us. Hallelujah. Text NCCC to 71441. Leave your information and I guarantee you, I got a team of people that'll pray and you'll get your prayer answered. And you know what? It will start you on making that new you in Christ. So with all those things being said, we want to thank God for you uh, watching this broadcast today. And we walk by faith, not by sight, no matter what. God bless you. Enjoy your day.